Should we follow up with people who express an interest in board service but then disappear? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Next question. And move on. <laughs> So would you like to elaborate, Andy? <laughs> why would you do that? Like, why would you put yourself in the position of, so like the, the only time that I've seen people do this and it's always a failure is it's when it's like, you're trying to get an elected or you're trying to get the person who's the CEO of the, whatever the big company is in your town. Right. And you, you really need that person on the board because you're super bad, need them on the letterhead, but you recognize that they're just going to be dead weight on the actual board. Um, I'm sure you have opinions on that. I think that's just a waste of everyone's time. Oh, it is a huge waste of time. And I'm with you. Uh, I mean, my my question to this question was, what would you do if a prof- like if a potential staff member did that? Like you, someone you were trying to hire and they just disappeared. Just would you, would you. you go like, oh, <laughs> yeah, they just ghost you, right? Like what, what would you do there? And it's, it's no different to me, right? This is a board position is an incredibly important position. It needs to be chosen wisely. And if someone's not interested or had a change of heart and they've ghosted you, then say la vie, like move on, right? And find somebody else. I think it's a complete energy suck too. And, and it shows, it screams desperation. Think about organizations that do that. Like they just keep nagging you. You're like, okay, like you're that (laughs) desperate. Like, no, I'm I'm not attracted to this at all. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything. The podcast about everything nonprofit with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Hey, Andy, you know what I'm really excited about? Mm, Christmas? Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know me so well. <laughs> I am excited about the conference, the Ann Conference that's yeah, coming up here. The like, fall conference is coming up. Yeah, I think it's October 14th and 15th. And there's lots of good speakers and topics, and it just, I think it's going to be a great educational session, plus like a good session to connect with everybody that we haven't seen in so long. I know some people are going to join virtually, but others will be there in person, and it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, that's a good option, right? You, there's the virtual option, but then you, if you want to do this, if you feel comfortable with this, it's, it's going to be at the center down in Las Vegas. So you'll get to actually, I don't know mingle for the first time in a long time Imagine which, that. with other nonprofits and things like that. And yeah, and the, and the, the, it's funny, we were looking at the list of people that are presenting and it's, it's almost like a nonprofit, everything who's who, right? Yeah. So you're, you're doing a keynote, right? Yep. Stacey's yep. going to do one of the keynotes. Um, so we've got uh, Jessica Sales at Holdsworth Russo, who's a frequent podcast, a guest expert. She's going to be presenting one. Um, Greg Wilkin, uh, John Waldron, uh, who else? Anthony Alonzo was a guest yeah. expert a long time ago. And recently, oh, Miles Dixon, Clay Buck. So it's like, seriously, it's like, if just in case you were wondering, like, these are the experts, which is why they're going to be presenting at the conference as well, which is great. Yeah, it's really, I, I just think it's going to be, it's kind of the whole theme is growth, opportunity, renewal. And I think we're all in the mindset to kind of move forward and think about what that looks like. And I think the conference is going to tee that up really well. Yeah, it's good. It's like a reset, right? Yeah, it is. And you know, just given a plug, a shameless plug for us. So we will be recording our podcast live. <laughs> Trying to record. Yikes. So if you want to see, if you want to see Andy freak out about things not working properly, that's a good place to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to do a live nonprofit, everything. We're going to collect questions, both from the attendees. And, you know, if you want to throw some questions in now, that's, you know, send it to us at nonprofit, everything, and we'll get those in the queue. Um, and we'll we'll try to you, you, we might actually drag some of those other guest experts back up on stage, depending on what the questions are, too. Absolutely. And I would say because I know some of you have these burning questions that aren't always ones that you want to tie your name to. So it's also cool if you say, hey, I want you guys to talk about this live, but please, <laughs> please don't share my name. And obviously we honor that request. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we Absolutely. Your, your secret. We want juicy questions. So, yeah, give us some good ones. Yeah, try to try. Yeah. So the the information on the 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 conference is available on the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits webpage. There's also a link in the Nonprofit Everything show notes. Um, so there's lots of different ways to get to it. See you there. See you there. What are the best practices when others hold fundraisers for your nonprofit? So. I'm a big believer on this one, having some guidelines or a policy in place that 
you give to somebody like if if they come and say like hey we're a company and we want to do like this fundraiser and raise money for you like great can we use your logo like i think there's got to be some sort of like a conversation and i say guidelines to make it a little more friendly but like hey here's scenarios where like either we need to look at how you use our logo here's language you need to use like you see these things where people hold a fundraiser and then say all of your donations will be tax deductible and like right it's like no it's not actually they're not they're actually not so you're mis misrepresenting right Uh. like so i think sort of you've got to be a partner with as much as people go great i'm gonna have people do these third-party fundraisers for me all the time Yes, that's sometimes a lot less of a headache than doing your own. But at the end of the day, like having some sort of guidelines and policies, like when does logo get used? Do they need to get their own insurance permit stuff? Like who's like, like, right? Protection if there's an injury or so awful thing that happens at the event, like whatever it is. Um, And then sort of being really clear about the tax deductibility language, what this is going to benefit. And I'm really super curious. I mean, beyond just your response to this question, but the, the thing that sort of um, needles at me with these opportunities is how do you set any control for what someone does with the money? So recently I had a, a, an organization that had shared with me this horror story of someone saying they did a fundraiser for them. They saw it promoted. They were okay with it. it was how, how it was promoted. They never got the money Ooh. ever. And there was no contract, no agreement, no anything. And I thought, how do you prevent that from happening? Like, is there a way to prevent that? Because it's out of your control when it's not yours. So I don't, Andy, what are your thoughts on all this? Mm, that's tough. So that for that particular scenario, that's when I'd like talk to the attorney general's office. Like, see, so call the AG's office because because there's a chance that that this is a professional scam, right? That they're they could use the logos and names of big organizations, just say they're doing a fundraising and they just pocket all the money. And that's something that the AG is going to go after. They, you know, there's enough there there and they want to make sure that that stops. Um, so that's something that you might want to call some law enforcement in on just to to make it go away. Um, the some of those other scenarios, like you know, there's still there's a person in town that probably if she remembers who I am, she probably still hates me because <laughs> she used to do this fundraiser every year. She had this big fundraiser. She'd like do it at a casino. It was this big party? She charged like a thousand dollars a ticket, and then like gave some of the money back to the nonprofit when she was done. And she was telling everybody it was like on her invitations and everything that a hundred percent of your thing was tax deductible. I'm like, number one. It, no, actually, none of it is tax deductible because you are not us. Like you're, you do not have a 501c3. You cannot accept tax deductible donations regardless of whether or not you're passing 100% of that on to somebody else. Or if there's like there's like tons of rules about yeah. it and you're going to get in trouble. And she was so mad. She like called me and like she had her attorney on the phone <sighs> with me and I'm trying to explain it to the attorney. I'm like, do you have an accountant? Because right. they will understand this, right? So yeah, she was very, very angry because she'd done it for years before I got Ugh. involved. And then once I was involved, she was very upset. So the other thing we'd see is like, and I don't know if they still do these is like a, like a quick serve restaurant or something. We'll say like, if you, it's like whatever nonprofit night, like yeah. come on in and pour a portion of your dinner yep. that you pay. Or if you buy the special dessert, a hundred percent of the proceeds from that special dessert will then be given to this nonprofit and they want to use your logo and all that kind of stuff. And it's always like this. How is it? is it worth it? Yeah. Like how much am I get? you know, may, I guess. Right. So, so it's, you kind of have to look at them one at a time. You're right. Get it in writing, whatever it is, make sure that it's in writing because that way when they vanish and the money is gone, you at least have a piece of paper that says, this is the person that called me. This is their name. This is what we agreed to. This is the agreement to use our logo, you know, with the expectation that this much was going to come back and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you just have to kind of be really explicit up front. I think you and I are a little bit, I mean, I will say because of the years we've worked in or with nonprofits, like in the nonprofit sector or with the, the nonprofits, we have seen, we've seen it all, right? And so I also, I mean, I do want to say for our listeners, not not everyone's out to get you. Um, <laughs> just most of I, them. <laughs> I mean, we're a little jaded, but not everybody is. So anyways, and there are, right, like these really well-intentioned people yeah, who are doing who stuff. Who just don't understand that, right, that there are just, rules. Yeah, yeah, which is why I think it's good to sort of have that thing in writing and sit down and actually have a conversation with them. I mean, because if they're cool with like 
playing by the rules and stuff, they could be gr- a great resource for you, right? Mm-hmm. Like from a fundraising stream, like great. Someone who gets the rules and then goes out and does it and does it in line with your rule, like like awesome. That that's easy money for you mm-hmm. instead of all that that labor and legwork. So so yeah, but but I do think these are the things where people get really giddy and excited and and say, great, we hand it off and like it can actually tarnish your reputation, right? Like as an organization. And so it also needs to be like to some degree, you know, you hear people who do these fundraisers sometimes and don't even tell a nonprofit. That makes me cringe because like a nonprofit gets to say yes or no, like, yes, we're okay with you doing this or not. But sometimes like it's free will, right? Like Andy, you could go out and do your own party and say you're, you know, helping the purple sneaker dog like foundation or whatever. Like, I don't know. Like, it's gotta so, be, it's yeah. gotta be some kind of animal they're, thing. They're, right? It does. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's, so it's interesting. So I'm, I'm a, a lot of my work is kind of on the other side now. So I do a lot of corporate foundation work. I work with you know, companies, philanthropy teams and like coming up with corporate social responsibility programs and things like that. And, and I like, it's interesting being on that side of the conversation a lot because the place that they're coming from there, a lot of times they're coming from a really good, yes. like well-meaning place. And they've got this, like, what if we do? And they come up with this really complicated scenario. And I always have to sort of talk them down out of their tree, which is like, well, this part of it is actually illegal because you're not a nonprofit. You can't do this. The law says X and you're kind of trying to do Y and the nonprofit's going to get in trouble. And the way I usually try to frame it is why don't you, why don't you tell the nonprofit what you want? Like instead of like coming up with an idea and then bringing this package to them, like, isn't this great? Like instead, if you go into the nonprofit and say, this is what we'd like to get. We need more employee engagement. We think our employee, we've talked to our employees and they're really interested in your mission and it aligns with what our business is. So is there a way that we can, I don't know, find something for us to do that supports you as a nonprofit? And it might be a fundraiser. It might not be a fundraiser. It might be something completely different. But if you have that like, conversation where you treat the nonprofit as if they are intelligent humans that might know their business better than you do, um, sometimes you get a much better answer. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. And I like that because it's also de- what you talk about talks about sort of a sense of humility, like instead of coming up with, I've got all the answer. Yeah, right? like, I'm, but, I'm, a, I'm a for-profit. I know yeah. way more than they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as I sit here cringing. <laughs> yeah. Andy, this one's for you. From a nonprofit perspective, is there a tax benefit to carrying debt? Our finance committee is used to debt in the for-profit world and how that is handled, and they recommend not paying down the loan we have. What do you recommend? So actually, there's kind of two different ways that you can look at the question. So one of the reasons that a for-profit might be wanting to carry debt is that the interest that they pay on that debt is tax deductible because it eats into their profits. So so one of the things that nonprofits don't pay that pro- for profits do pay is when you make a profit if you have a surplus at the end of the year, you get taxed on that surplus. So in in times where they can break e- come w- come up with ways to break even, they're paying less in federal tax on that profit, right? So from a nonprofit perspective, we're like, I don't know what that is, right? Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> like, like first of glazing all, over. Yeah. yeah. Surpluses are awesome. We want those, <laughs> right? And you don't have to pay because because you're you're always using it to further the mission of the nonprofit. I mean, it's the whole point of being a nonprofit is that profit por- portion that you're getting, you don't have to pay any federal tax on. That's what your that's what your tax exemption is actually for, right? So in in that instance, if like holding debt to lower your profit, to lower your federal taxes makes no sense because you pay no, pay no federal taxes. The other side of it is the liquidity side. So if you have a loan, so, so say you've got a bunch of money and like, you know, you got, you've got a loan, like a mortgage on a building, right? You got a mortgage on a building. You're going to pay this thing over 25 years, right? You're going to pay a little bit a year for 25 years. You get a massive gift from someone. They give you a million dollars. You have a couple of options of what you can do with that million dollars. You could pay off your building and then never have to pay that mortgage payment again. That's one option. Or you can think of something else to do that mil- with that million dollars. Right. Mm. So from a from a nonprofit perspective, you actually have a completely different scenario. Like the taxes piece of it doesn't matter, but the liquidity piece of it absolutely does matter. That million dollar, you don't have to pay that loan now. It's already a loan. Yeah. It's gonna it's That's it's gonna point. it's like expenses that are spread over a long period of time. So dumping it all down now would be really, really smart. So that may be what your board is saying, and they just don't know the words to use to explain it to you that way. Yeah. But if you got a big gift, there's no reason to pay down debt. Like, like if you're just a private person and you've got a big credit card bill, 
right? Liquidity is not as important to you as a human going through life. So if you have a giant credit card bill, like you might want to pay that thing down fast because the interest is going to eat into everything else and it grows over time and it becomes a pain in the ass. Now, if I recall, any types of loans are usually included in audit notes and on the financials, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that reflected. And so I also think that, um, I mean, I can share from a perspective of like a donor funder perspective, Sometimes if you have astute donors and funders, not not all of them are, but some who like dig into that, they may ask you questions about the debt, right? And what exactly that is. And, you know, you see things as small as, okay, at some point you were struggling as a nonprofit and a board member made a loan, an interest, you know, or a small interest loan to your nonprofit or whatever that agreement or arrangement was um, versus something large like a mortgage spread out like you just suggested. And so, I mean, all of that gets captured. And I think you just have to also make sure that you're clear on like, why do you make the decisions around debt that you choose to pay off debt that you, you know, maybe it makes more sense to use the money for furthering your mission right now because the need is so high. Yeah. Hang on. I'll be right back. I have to go get my soapbox. Okay. I'm back. So debt is not bad. Short-term loans are not bad. Funders need to fully understand that. So a lot of federal grants that come in are reimbursement grants. Like, okay, the federal government's going to give you $3 million in a year, right? Where am I going to get $3 million? So you have to actually either have a nest egg. You have to be just like magically have all this money to be able to spend already. Or you need to go find it somewhere so you can do your mission. And this is like, I mean, think about it as like a completely secured loan. So if you're going to get, and and banks are like, I don't know, you're a nonprofit. This is complicated, even though it isn't. (laughs) They're, they're going to have a hard time giving you that money sometimes, because even though you're like, look, this is literally guaranteed by the federal government. You're going to give me $3 million. I'm going to do X with it, which is within this contract that I've got. They're going to give me $3 million back. And then I pay you and we're all good. Right. Right. And that the whole time, all of that information stays on those financial statements. And then audit, you know, funders who are sophisticated read it and go look at this giant loan yes right and what they need to understand is like that is how the work is getting done because no one's giving them three million dollars to sit on because the ratings agencies for example will ding you if you have too much of a nest egg if you're sitting on too much money if your surplus is too high like they think you should be i don't know hair shirt monk nonsense from the (laughs) 1300s where you're not like spending any money and you're totally (laughs) ascetic right like a your your building can't have any carpet in it because you know that's a luxury like that behavior is like perpetuated even by the ratings agencies who then give you three stars instead of four stars right. because you've got too much money salted away because the reality is, is that you're saving that up to do something amazing in a year. And if someone would like actually ask the question, you could explain that. But instead they're like, well, look at this number. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Check minus. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, you know, that's obviously I love my your soapbox, soapbox though. So I love soapbox. you. I, I love you getting on your soapbox. <laughs> it's fun for all our listeners. It's fun for me because I could actually watch you get on your soapbox too. So, um, but no, like I, So to me, like one of the undercurrents besides the actual answer you gave, right? But the undercurrent is like also like these are healthy discussions that I don't think a lot of organizations are having and should be having like about this kind of stuff, right? Like, and so you took me off on sort of a um, a kind of a a tailspin, but like one of the things, yeah, you, (laughs) well, but like I'm sitting here thinking like, um, like one of the things that like when you see organizations that have this nest egg and actually it just keeps building and it isn't because it's for anything planned big, but they just keep adding because they feel safer with it. Mm -hmm, Like that's a problem too. And like, so those are like, okay, there's some degree of safety that people need, like, and, and you need to have the operating reserve for all the things that can go wrong. And like, at what point are you actually really doing a disservice to your donors and to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Like just having it sort of yeah, squirreled away. So like, I guess I just, I I sit there and I think all of this for me, like the big theme for a non-finance person is that these types of discussions need to be brought up and hopefully you've got a finance committee and a board that's thinking through some of these harder questions. Yeah. And the, 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 I mean, that's a fantastic point because the question that needs to be asked is what's this for? Right. Like you're sitting on $17 million. What's that for? Right. And, and you need to get an answer back from them that satisfies you as a donor. Like what's that 17 million for? Like, oh, we just, you know, rainy day, yeah. right? That's the wrong answer. Clearly it's like, well, what we're trying to do is once we get to 24 million, 
we can buy X, right? Or we can launch this massive new thing, which is going to change this, right? Which is the right answer probably, Yeah. right? But if it's like, oh yeah, we just hate carrying debt and um, our ED needs a helicopter. So... I'm the executive director of a well-established organization, and we have recently received funding to double our staffing and potentially open a second location. While we're really excited about this, we're also nervous about maintaining the strong culture we currently have. It's so refreshing to have staff and volunteers with no associated drama. How do we grow this fast and also keep the culture we've created? Gosh, first of all, congratulations. I love right. Right. I love it when you hear people growing. Mm-hmm. Gosh, doubling staff. That's like, that's amazing. So congrats to you. Uh, I think culture, like, I'm so glad you asked this question because it's something that I don't think nonprofits always do a great job of focusing on. And yet um, it's so critical and permeates throughout every aspect of an organization. So, um, I mean, I think one thing I would do if I were in your shoes is I would talk to the current staff and say, you know, let's talk a little bit about our culture. We've got something special here. Like, let's talk about what you think makes this work. Like, how would you describe our culture to somebody else? And um, are there things you think that we should be thinking about as we're hiring people? And like, literally engage them, because I'm assuming your culture is probably an open, engaging culture to begin with. And so engaging them and getting some of their feedback and then literally utilizing that, whether it's volunteers, board members, new staff members, like really use utilizing that lens when you're recruiting to to ask some culture questions or ask some questions that get at how people think about culture, how they act. I know it's there's no guarantee, right? People put their best f- foot forward. <laughs> On interviews, <laughs> yes, and then do. you get the like, like w- wicked, you know, I don't know, wicked witch <laughs> of the West, but like, but but I'm like, you know, you can at least show that's like showcase that's a priority, and I don't know, do your best, like, but but good for you for keeping an eye on it. Yeah, I like I I I agree. I think so. This is going to sound super like nerdy and planning nerd to say it this way, but if you think your culture is amazing, you need to find out a way to formalize that and document it like something like so so like nonprofits don't have this problem well the culture problem not necessarily they they sometimes have the culture problem but but they don't really have the why are the employees here problem as often as for profits do so for profits a lot of times you know like it's a job i mean I'm, you'll hear that well, it's a job like i'm getting paid yeah. to do it i don't really care and nonprofit employees a lot of times are are not the same as they're doing it because they're they have some interest in the mission. They may not be super passionate about the mission, but they've got some interest in the mission. So you're already kind of on your way to to having an engaged workforce that's interested in what it is you're doing sort of from a mission perspective, right? And you spend a lot of time documenting the mission, but what you don't spend a lot of time doing is documenting like how how we're going to behave with one another, like that sort of interpersonal relationship stuff. Because I mean, just me, I've been in a whole bunch of different organizations that have different cultures that, you know, one place where like, I mean, this was a long time ago, obviously, but like you you couldn't like get from the front door to your desk without having someone hug you. It was just that kind of place. Right. Um, we wouldn't do that anymore. (laughs) For a variety of reasons. Fist bump, uh, elbow (laughs) bump. Yeah. (laughs) Right. But, but there's something to be said about if you like the way your culture is now, come up with a way might be like a for-profit business might call it like an ethics statement or something that talks about like what's most important to us. Is it, you know, is it important that we have downtime as a team that if you have vacation days, you have to take them. You can't just let them pile up and never take a vacation. Or is your culture the other way around where everybody's always on and everybody's always there? So if you can document that kind of stuff and then and then make everybody that's in your current organization sort of agree with like, yeah, this is kind of how our office works, then you can share that with new people coming in, like even at the interview stage. Because I think a lot of people would like to know if you're coming into a new place and the the culture, which you really like and you think is really positive is, oh yeah, you can call me at three o'clock in the morning and I'll totally respond to your email. Somebody might not think that's awesome, right? (laughs) (laughs) But, but for you and this current group, so you really have to enumerate, I guess what I'm getting at is you really have to enumerate what you mean by we have a great culture and what that means for your organization so that you can share that with new folks coming in and not just assume that what you have is perfect and they're just going to come along for the ride or, you know, whatever. And you know, you you raise a great point because I also think there's opportunity 
for organizations to to use their values that they you know those values that they they list here's our core values right. on the website which usually are a bunch of gobbledygook right. right that don't always mean anything or translate but like i always say when i'm working with groups and we're talking about core values i will say what does that look like in reality day to day? Like what does, so here's this value that you say is important to you, right? A value you espouse. What does that look like when you make decisions? What does that look like when you have conflict or don't agree with someone in the office? How does, what happens in those circumstances? What's important, right? And so I think really getting down to those brass tacks and getting concrete, and maybe that's the discussion with your team, right? Like, hey, I know we have an, we all say we have an amazing culture. Like, let's talk about what that looks like because we want to use some specific examples in these interviews. I mean, what a cool, what a cool place to be. So, so keep it up. And yeah, please like, I, I honestly think if someone else doesn't, someone new doesn't fit your, your culture, then you got to look at some exit plan quickly because one person, one toxic person, you and I have seen it, Andy, can like ruin it all. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can we answer the corollary though, which is like our culture is not as awesome as we'd like it to be. <laughs> which is probably more typical. <laughs> which is, yeah, which is yeah. what you'd expect the question yeah. to be, right? Yeah. And like you're bringing new people. So so that you can use some of the same methods that you're talking about to, to move your culture from where it is now to a place where you think it's going to be better by doing some of the same things. By talking about, like you said, like this is our... This is our value. Our value is compassion. What does that mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, like coming up with concrete examples of what you mean by compassion and then, and then getting everybody to kind of agree to it and then seeing if you can, you know, maybe hire on people that are going to be pushing you in more in that direction. Like if like, you know, COVID's made a lot of people kind of get burnout crazy too. Yeah, like yeah. we were, we were talking earlier about like a sort of a crisis in, in one of the one of the larger kinds of organizations where there's a certain type of employee that's just straight up quitting. So there's like a a, a ton of vacancies in this one particular role with these very large organizations. Um, Just because it's, just because it's hard to do like the pressure over the last year and a half has been over the top and these people are just giving up. Mm -hmm. Um, So like coming up with like, okay, so let's figure out what's going to prevent that from happening next time. Is it, is it, is culture part of the challenge? Is it that, um, that always on like, you know, or, or the, the, the need to serve the community because this is a time of crisis. And so it's up to you to dig deep. And when, you know, when nothing, nothing additional comes along with the request to dig deep, I'm not going to give you any more money. I'm not going to give you more time off. I'm not going to give you any more authority. Like, all of those things, you know, it's going to stay the same. But what I really want from you is just like 150% effort. You're going to burn people out. And so there's an opportunity to say, what are we going to do to prevent people from burning out? Can we tweak the culture um, by doing by doing what things to make it better? Yeah. And also, yeah, and it, we're broken. We've got a broken culture, guys. How are we? Let's rebuild this together because it's not just one person. It's all of us. Right. And having that kind of team spirit behind it. And I think, you know, people who are her interviewing for a job hopefully will feel that energy, passion and authenticity. And I also think if you're not if your culture isn't exactly where you want it to be yet and you are interviewing, I don't, you know, you're not going to tell the person that it's a train wreck and that they should run for the hills, but you are, you are in a position to say, listen, we are actually really making effort and strides toward improving our culture. And one of the ways we're doing this is X, Y, and Z. And part of our hiring process is looking really carefully at people who are going to only contribute and add to our desired culture at the end of it. Right. I think being transparent is, I, I say it a lot, even with board stuff, like when people say, Oh, our board is so broken. And I, how do we, we can't recruit board members till we get it perfect or until we do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, like you just have to be honest and transparent. Some people actually are like eager and like hungry for, okay, I'm up for the challenge. Yeah. Like I'll help move you from A to B. Woo, you did it. Hopefully you don't, you know, feel as exhausted as I just sounded about, woo, you did it. But it <laughs> is Friday while we're recording this. So in all in all fairness, anyways, you made it through another episode of Nonprofit Everything. And Andy and I sure appreciate you being uh, a listener, you sending us your questions. And as a reminder, we are always, always looking for questions. Anytime, day or night, when you're in the shower, when you're on your run, when you're, you know, driving, we've got 
the phone number you can use, which we'll put in the show notes, or whether you just want to ping us or go through the nonprofiteverything.com website to send us your question, we are here to answer it. And as a reminder, uh, this is a production of the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits, and who is having their conference. If you haven't heard us plug it enough, we're going to plug it once again, because it's a really cool conference on October 14th and 15th, and you can still register and be there, whether virtually or in person. And I think that's all.